Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Links to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. Exodus chapter 11 The Lord said to Moses, Let one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people, that they ask every man of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Exodus chapter 12 The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons according to what each can eat, you shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it. Its head with its leg and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass to the land of Egypt that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day I shall be for you a memorial day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what every one needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day, out your generations of the statute forever. In the first month from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread till the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. 
whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select lambs for yourself according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that it is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through you to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door, and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. He shall observe this right as a statue for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by the service? You shall say, It is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Up! Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel. Go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls, being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians, and the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, and about six hundred thousand men on foot besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait. Nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statue of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, that he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native, and for the stranger who sojourns among you. O oh, the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, and on that very day the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. The following is the English translation of Pastor Mong An Wu's teaching on the book of Exodus, chapter 11 to 12, translated by Ray. Read the Bible every day so you will be full of faith. So today we will continue on Exodus chapter 11 and 12. Remember in the chapter 10, you can see that Pharaoh, he just keep negotiating with Moses and Aaron. However, Moses, he keeps stand firm for God's principle and he refused to compromise. So next in chapter 11, you will see the Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. So remember in the previous chapter, Pharaoh said to him, 
get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. So God eventually do one thing that to a degree that Pharaoh will actually beg you to leave. So their families here in verse one, you have to see one important spiritual principle. The spiritual principle is that if today, if we accept the compromise from the world, then we will be urged to stay in the world. The world, they are so longing to have this union and connection with us. The world really wants to have us. So either today you are having compromised with the first condition, second, third, or fourth condition that the world is giving you. Either it's that, oh, only the man can go, but the woman and the little one has to stay. Or, oh, everyone can go, but you have to keep her flocked and hurt. You know, the world will just keep always try to have this connection with us. Today, if we are willing to be stand firm absolutely for God's word, and we are determined to not have any connection with this world, with Egypt, with Satan, with Pharaoh, with the king of the world, then they will do one thing, that is they will try to drive us away completely. So this is an important spiritual principle. And that's also why in the Beatitudes it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Because we are supposed to be hated by the world. We are supposed to be not accepted by the world. This is the principle of the world. So did you see that? There is one principle called the principle of the tree of life. And there's another principle, which is the principle of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When we are working in the principle of the tree of life, we will not be accepted by the world. So Egypt, the Pharaoh, he will try to drive Israelites away completely because all the negotiation that he tried to make with us, we will not accept. So in that case, then you guys should just go. But if we are not determined enough to choose God, then the world will see us as someone who can be urged to say. But today, if we are absolutely choosing God, be determined to follow him, then it will be like in the first Corinthians chapter four, it says the world will see us like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things, and will really drives us away. So we have to say, we have to see that the world is just a place that we are sojourning. So next in verse two, speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. So note that here is not a robbery, but instead it's trying to return the things that to God's people that is due for them because of these 400 years of slavery. So remember, in this end time, there is a very wrongful teaching that we need to be careful. That is something called the great transfer of wealth. It says that, oh, in the end time, all the money of the world will be transferred to under Christian's hand. And then they will try to cite this verse. But you have to remember that we did not went through these 430 years of slavery. And in these 430 years of slavery, the world, the Egypt, they have robbed the Israelites away from the things that is due for them. So that's why here God speaks to his people, say that you shall ask for silver and gold jewelry from your neighbor because it's to repay for all the labors that they have done in the past 430 years. It's a repay. And also know that these monies are supposed to be used to build the tabernacle. So it's not the so-called quote unquote, the great transfer of the well, all oh, the money will go to my bank account. I can spend it at my own will. We have to be discerning about these differences. So next Moses said, thus says the Lord about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle. So God will go out in the midst and judge and all the firstborn shall die. You might say that, oh, isn't it unlucky for the firstborn? But actually, this is another spiritual principle is that the consequence, what the firstborn son they choose, it will determine the consequence of all the following kids. If the firstborn, he refused the salvation, then his consequence is death. Then he will bring all the people behind him to also lead to death. But if the firstborn son, he can receive the salvation, then the next son, the second son, and all the children behind, they can all receive salvation through generations. So please don't say that it's unfair. You know, sin came into the world through one man, Adam. You might feel that, oh, it's so unfair. 
but at the same time, the salvation of Christ, Jesus Christ Himself, He's the favor of the Lord, but He sacrificed Himself because of the, our sin. And today, because of one person's sacrifice, we are all now under the same blessing. We are saved from the judgment of the fire. Do you think it's fair? If you see that, you can see that this is actually not fair. But this is the principle of grace, and this principle of grace is intrinsically unfair. And it's to try to teach us so that we can all enter into God's salvation, that everyone can receive salvation. So why is God walking in the midst of Egypt to kill the firstborn? He's telling them again that you will have another chance, and I will always give you a way out. And that's why later in chapter twelve, He will further teach us how to pass over the destroying angel and how to pass over death. So here in chapter eleven, verse six to verse ten, indeed God is now doing a thing. But from verse eight to ten, later on it. Not be Pharaoh's summon Moses and Aaron, but Pharaoh will beg to see Moses and Aaron, and will ask them to all get out, you and all the people who follow you. And Moses went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So why this God has to bring all these plagues? Remember these three very important spiritual principle, and today we can also pray in front of the Lord according to these three principle. So the first principle is that Lord, may you destroy all the idol and all the false god. Remember, the purpose of the plague is to help the Egyptians to get rid of all the idols and false god. So these ten plagues, they are all targeting for each different kinds of idols in Egypt. So the first step of the plagues of disaster is to completely destroy the idol worship and completely destroy the power of Satan. So today we we can pray, Lord, I'm not afraid of the upcoming disaster. I'm not afraid of the upcoming plagues because Lord, I will beg you. I will pray that you will destroy any power from Satan. You will destroy the control and oppression of Satan on everyone's heart. You will completely destroy the confusion caused by the Satan. That the confusion that people thought that the idol has a power. Idol can bring blessing. You, you will, Lord, may you destroy all those things. May you, through the disasters that you brought, you will completely destroy the authority of the idol. And this is the first prayer that we can make. And the second prayer that we should pray that when the plague comes, we have to be set apart. Of course, the plagues come so that they can save Israelites. But the purpose is not for the Egyptians to suffer. Remember, the plagues is to have the Egyptians to tell their sons and grandsons so that they can know that the Lord is the only one true God. So today, the second prayer that we can make is that Lord, through all the disaster, through the chaos of the in the politics, in the finances, in the layoff, earthquake, famine, plagues, Lord, may you help everyone's heart to turn back to you, and we can pray that Lord, you will really. Let people's heart turn back to you, and as everyone is talking about the politics, economy, global warming, or earthquake, Lord, may you open their hearts so that they can see you as the only one true God. So again, the purpose of the disaster is to not to scare us, but instead is to destroy any authority of Satan. Is to have people's heart to be released, and to is to have the Egyptians give them this opportunity to receive salvation. You know, even the people in WHO they can receive salvation. And then next, the third principle is to want to edify God's people. So remember, the Israelites through these process of the ten plagues, they see very clearly. They know that who is set apart and who is not set apart. They know that what belongs to God and what does not belong to God. So all these plagues, from the first plague to the ninth plague to the ten plagues, it's all telling us that God's people can be edified. God's people can be protected, and God's people's heart can be built up, so that when the disaster come, we are not just being afraid, and but instead, when the disaster come, we can see how peacefully we are being protected under cover by God's salvation, under the protection of God's Almighty, so that we can be built up. Our faith can be encouraged. Our peace, our courage, our reliance on God can keep increasing. 
So also remember previously in chapter five, the Israelites were complaining. They complained to Moses for the additional labor after he talked to Pharaoh, right? But when the disaster come, you will see that in all these previous couple chapter, none of the people of Israelites they are complaining. Why? Because they are also seeing God's move. So remember these three spiritual principles when the disaster come. These things is something that we can really pray. Lord, may you destroy any authority from Satan. May you destroy any power of idol. Lord, may you help so that the unbelievers can receive salvation. Lord, may you rise up your church. May you build your people so that we will know how to rely on you closely. And next, in chapter twelve, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, telling them that the ten plagues is coming, the plague of killing of the firstborn is coming. But you know, because of God's mercy, actually, in the beginning of chapter four, even before God sent Moses back to Egypt. He already asked Moses to tell Pharaoh that if you refuse to let Israel go, I will kill your firstborn son. However, after such a long time, after all the reminders from the past nine plagues, God's mercy, God's grace, God's reminder, and God also gave Pharaoh many chances. But God also allowed Pharaoh's heart to be hardened until, in the end, God's judgment. He has to bring down the last plagues. But here, also through these last plagues. He is also trying to let the Israelites know how can we live under God's cover and His protection. So that's why in the beginning he tells Moses and Aaron, "This month shall be for you the beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year for you." So it's roughly on like March or April, basically the first week after the first full moon after spring equinox, and that is the Passover time and basically Easter time. So know that. I- Time the first month of Egyptians is roughly July or August, but why shall God change the calendar? So remember, each time when God changes the calendar, changes the schedule, is to help bring us back into God's timeline, starting from the Genesis of the of the original beginning. Remember, in Genesis chapter one and two, God has His own timeline. So as long as we walk into God's timeline, then our life will be memorable. But if we today if we don't live in God's timeline, then even though we busy out through our entire life, but there's nothing worth remembering in our entire life. And in the book of Malachi, it says that our life has to be of remembrance to the Lord. Our life has to be of regard in God's eyes. And also in the book of Revelation, it talked about the book of life. And there's also the book of remembrance, and it recorded our years and everything we did. So that's why God here He has to reset, reset the schedule, reset the calendar, so that we can always live in God's timeline. So tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. So here, God is talking about a culture of family. You know, salvation is always in the unit of household. It's not just by yourself. If your household has two little people, then either your household has to grow, or you have to have this union with your neighbor. And so, this is the prototype of a home church, and it's also a prototype of early churches. And it's talking about the fundamental unit of salvation. The salvation will never be just of a unit of a person, but it's always in a unit of a household. So today you can、uh, take hold of this scripture, saying that Lord, my family, entire family has to be saved. If my, maybe my parents are not saved, my children are not saved, my spouses are not saved. Remember that the Passover is to pre- is prepared for the entire family. Maybe today we don't have a lot of people in our family, but we can still have this union with other family. We can have this union with our neighbor, and you can together you can eat the Passover lamb. So we can pray for our parents, pray for our family, pray for our children. So even if today maybe your entire family everyone is Christian, praise God. But you should ask yourself, what about the family of your siblings? Maybe they don't have a lot of people. What about your sister's family, your brother's family, your in-laws' family, your friends' family? You know, many different household can. Can merge together, can have this union to enjoy the abundance of salvation. Remember, 
the salvation is not just in your household, but should be in your entire family line. God does not wish that any should perish, but He desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. We should pray hard for the salvation of my family, for our brothers, for our sisters, for our in-laws, even the family of my best friend, to bring them all into the same salvation. Let us all eat the Passover lamb together. And next, it talks about how to choose the lamb. And so, from starting from verse five till the end, all these details we will recap again in the book of Leviticus, and even we will talk about it in the four gospel. We will talk about it in more detail. And here, so here, the lamb has to be one year old without defect, and we have to take care of him for four days. Remember, you take the lamb on the tenth day of this month and slaughter him on the fourteenth day of the month. So this lamb will actually live with you for four days. So you can really examine that the lamb is without defect, and also this lamb will live with us. They don't just live in a sheepfold, but this specific lamb is in our house, live with us for four days, and we cherish this lamb as if the best, our favorite lamb. But this lamb, after four days, he has to be slaughtered, so that we can really feel the pain when our favorite one in our life dies for us because of our sin. We are the one who is supposed to shed blood. It's rather than this lamb who is blameless. We are supposed to die on the altar. We are supposed to shed blood. But today, when we see this lamb, he shed blood for us, and that's why we have to live with him for four days. And that's also why Jesus he lived in Jerusalem for four days. You know, every single thing that he do corresponds to every single event during the Exodus. So. Take some of the blood and put it on the sides and top of the door frames. The destroyer will only recognize the blood and does not recognize the family. So it's not about how many people are there in your household. It's only about whether there is blood on the sides and the top of the door frames. So today, our family, it's not about whether you are good Christians or not, but it's ultimately about whether you are and her families dwell in God's. Salvation dwell in the salvation of Christ. So today, may the Lord bless us to know that even though salvation is in the unit of a household, but that doesn't mean if you became a Christian, your entire family can be saved. You have to pray hard for this promise, and you have to share the gospel so that this promise can really be accomplished in our family. And then the meat has to be roasted over the fire. You cannot eat raw or boiled in water. I roasted it over a fire. Why? Because here the lamb he received the roasting of the fire for us, and that represents that each one of us we are supposed to receive the judgment of fire. We are supposed to be in the eternal lake of fire. But today we are saved. We eat the Passover lamb, so that we don't need to receive the roasting of the fire. But instead, the lamb received the roast over the fire for us. And also, you cannot eat raw or boiled in water. Later on, we will talk more detail in the book of Leviticus. It's all telling us that every single punishment Jesus Christ he has received for us, and Jesus saved us from the judgment of the fire, and Jesus endured the stripes for us. So that's why we don't eat it raw and we don't eat it in the boiled water, so that we can really see that the Lamb he indeed. Die on the cross for us completely for our sin. So and also you cannot leave any of it till the morning. You cannot have any left over. That means we cannot waste God's salvation. So we have to eat the lamb hastily. Remember in verse eleven it tells us that we should eat in haste. That means the salvation we have to really grab it firmly, grab it tightly. And then next in verse twelve, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. So here, see that again. This is the first prayer when we talk about the three spiritual principles. Remember that all the judgment is to destroy the idols on earth. And next, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So today, may the Lord help us that for all the parents, if we have the wisdom from God, that we will know that we should always pray for our family that the precious blood of Jesus Christ will cover us. You know, nowadays God's judgment, His justice will definitely be executed all over the earth. 
Today, not all the judgments only wait until the very end, but instead, right now, through the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, there are already some judgments, some cleansing here and there, some regional judgments here and there. So we really need to pray that Lord, may your precious blood covers my family, covers our children. May your blood be covered on the side and tops of our door frames and really help my unbelieving family members, they can also become believer uh, as soon as possible, and your precious blood will also be on them. Next, in verse 14, this is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So there are seven festivals of the Lord, and the first one is the Passover. And so through the festival of the Lord, we can start to enter into our Christian life. And the first thing, the first stop of our Christian journey is to enter into the precious blood, to receive the salvation through eating and drinking, through partaking Jesus Christ, through enjoying Jesus Christ. We get to save ourselves from the curses and judgment of death. And this is the meaning of Passover. Maybe today we don't celebrate Passover with Jewish people, but we should never forget that the festival of the Lord, it's not called the Jewish festival, but instead it's called the festival of the Lord. So we have to be very carefully live, abide in the salvation of Passover. And we will not lose the fullness of our salvation, our blessings, our destiny because of our negligence, laziness, or the temptations from the wealth of the world. And this is something that we have to keep praying about. And next verse 16, on the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. This day will only start doing this when they have the tabernacle. And then you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that, so you know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is always with the Passover. And when we completely get rid of all the yeast, all the leaveners, that means we are get rid, getting rid of all the corruption in our life. And then, so next, from verse 10 to verse 22, indeed, they do accordingly. So they take a bunch of Hesop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. So here what it's saying is that we have the precious blood as the mark of our salvation and we should not leave our salvation. So today, Lord, may you help us. Today, maybe we are committed in a certain churches or maybe there are some reasons that you have to change churches. But the key is that wherever we go, we have to commit in that church. We have to submit to the authority, to the order of Jesus Christ. And we have to always abide in the covenant of Jesus. And next in verse 25, And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. Here the word service is also translated as ceremony. But in Hebrew, it's more about service. So you shall keep this service, ceremony or service. This also is related to our work. So today we keep this as a statute forever throughout our generations. It's not just in the Jewish people, but it's actually on every single sons and daughters of God. This ceremony, this service to eat the Passover lamb and to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread during the Passover time to get rid of every single corruption in our life and to partake again God's salvation, to really eat and drink Jesus Christ and to proclaim that his precious blood covers my family and we are determined not to leave this salvation. This ceremony, this service is actually something that is imperative in our life. Today, you know, we have many different kinds of serving in a church and we really encourage you to join them but there are some of the service that is written in the Bible that we often neglect. Later on, we will also talk about it. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it's also about a service. And when Jesus talked about worshiping him in spirit and in truth, it's also a service. And here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 25, we have to keep the service of Passover, this service that we have to teach our sons and daughters to partake in Jesus. It's also an important service. So we shall never forget to teach our children as well. In verse 26 and 27, And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, 
for he passed over the house of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. So here, God really emphasized family education, and He really emphasized that the education about the religion, about faith, should happen in family rather than at church. So don't just think that oh, maybe today you send your children to the Sunday school to the youth fellowship group, then it's okay. No, but instead, the responsibility of teaching our children. To know God, to fear God, to serve God, to know Bible is actually the responsibility of parents. And maybe you might say, "Oh, when I was a kid, my parents also they are not believers, so I always learned these from Sunday school." Then we have can have this determination that starting from my generation, we will be the one that can help our next generation to fulfill to achieve their destiny. And maybe your children they are now all grown up. Or maybe you are a grandparents already. You know there are still many young people at church. There are still many new believers, the first generation Christians. We can also help them and be their spiritual parents. So don't just be a church goer, but instead be someone who can always act according to God's will. In Exodus chapter twelve, to always teach and nurture and raise our next generation in God's kingdom and at church, and to really be a spiritual. Parents, this is a very important responsibility to keep this service and to teach our children. Remember, the festival of the Lord should be the top priority in our life. Keep the feast of Passover, enter into His salvation, and partake and enjoy Him. Next, in verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine, then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And there is indeed this recording in the history, and so now they said, "Go, go, go! All、oh, get out, please!" And verse thirty-two: Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, "We shall all be dead." So remember, this is the principles of the world. When we are determined to want God, the world will not try to keep us. Whenever we feel that we are being kept by the world. Actually means that we already we are already living in compromise. We are already wavering. If today we are very determined to want God, the world will hate us. They will not want us. So indeed, next in verse thirty four, everyone left. And here the number of six hundred thousand is only counting the men on foot. So if you also add women and children, then there should roughly be around two to three million people. And next in verse thirty eight, a mixed multitude also went up with them. And very much livestock, both flocks and herds. So here, the so-called mixed multitude, maybe it's talking about the Jewish people who intermarry with the Egyptians, or maybe there might be some Egyptians. They also want to leave Egypt and they want to follow the, the Israelites. So don't necessarily think that these mixed multitude is a bad thing. But we also have to be careful because these mixed people eventually in the wilderness. These mixed multitudes, they are also a group of people who are frequently complaining. So in the end, the Israelites not only didn't they influence them positively, but instead they are being negatively influenced by these mixed multitudes people. So we have to be really careful about that. And next, in verse forty-one, at the end of four hundred thirty years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is the night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. So in our previous episodes, we mentioned that some people we really won't feel that oh they are the army, they are the hosts of the Lord. How can these slaves be the hosts of the Lord? But today, God again He says that they are the hosts of the Lord. Today, don't look down on the youth in our church, and also don't look down blue collar workers. So even though they, some people may look like they just became a believer, they know nothing. But God already see them as the hosts of the Lord, as the army. So today, as long as someone he truly enters into the salvation and he's truly keeping the Passover, then now he has this new identity. It's an identity as a soldier, as a warrior. So today, we as a Christian, we are not just waiting to enter into heaven after we got baptized, but instead we have many different identities that we have to fulfill 
step-by-step in salvation. So we have to ask ourselves, do I cherish my identity as a soldier, as a warrior in the Lord? Do I cherish my identity as a priest? Do I cherish my identity as a true son of God? So today we have to constantly respond to the calling, our due position as the bride of Jesus. This kind of calling, we have to step into it step by step. So today, when we first became a believer, God see us as the host of the Lord. Remember that the army will never be just one person. No soldiers fight alone. So today you have to enter, you have to be committed to a church. You have to enter this family to pray together, to fight the warfare together, and to keep the inheritance that God has given you together. So next, starting verse 43, after the Passover, there's another uh, requirement from them. So this is the statue of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised them. So here it's talking about circumcision. It's a complete separation from the world, a complete rejection to our flesh. To receive the circumcision means we completely submit to Jesus' uh, grace. And so no foreigners or hired worker may eat of it. Only the ones who truly receive the salvation of Jesus Christ can eat. And in verse 46, it's talking about where we should eat the lamb. It shall be eaten in one house. And this is in the land that God has measured for us, the family that God has measured for us. We should eat the Passover lamb in the church that God has measured for us. So next in verse 49, there shall be one law for the native and for the strangers who sojourns among you. So everyone is the same. It's the same law. Everyone receives circumcision, keep the Passover, and there will be the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintels of the houses, and everyone can receive salvation. And finally, in verse 51, and on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their host. So here is not talking about a bunch of escaping slaves. Ah! I'm free, I'm released, so they start to walk by their own way. No, but today a Christian, after they got saved, they became part of the host, part of the army. So they are brought out from Egypt in the unit of hosts. They are not a bunch of scattered slaves, but they are an ordered army with all the abundance, with all the blessings and grace, with all the promise and power, they leave Egypt. So today, their families here in chapter 11 and 12, there are a couple things that you really need to take a hold of it and really pray accordingly. Of course, for the disaster that is upcoming, there are three very important prayers. But here, we should also grab firmly the salvation of the Passover. We have to teach our next generation to know how to partake in Jesus, how to partake in the Passover lamb. And also tell them that our family is to build upon this foundation of salvation. And we have to pray for the people who hasn't been saved, our relatives, the people we love, your best friends, pray for their salvation as well. And finally, we should also tell ourselves only the one who receives circumcision can eat the Passover lamb. So foreigners or the uncircumcised, they cannot eat. Even though God's salvation is open for everyone, but to receive it, there is a criteria. We have to receive circumcisions. So it's not just that, okay, I make this sinner's prayer, then I became a Christian. But instead, to receive a circumcision is a true recognition that I can no longer rely on myself. I have to have this complete set apart from my past life in sin. Only these kind of people, they can eat the Passover lamb. Only these kind of people, they are the hosts of the Lord. Only these kind of people, they will receive the transfer of wealth so that we can build the tabernacle together. Amen.